three, two. Farts. Old farts. Two old farts. Steve and Dave. Sometimes you find a diamond in the rough. Not this time, though. This is just rough. Two old farts. There is no better waste of time. Two guys. Two old guys. A lot of BS and more drivel than you can shake a stick at. Steve and Dave. God help us. Uh, this God fellow, I'm looking forward to meeting this guy because he's helping well, us he's, a lot. Apparently. He's a rem- he's a remote worker, Stephen. So we're in the right I, place. I, this is a good thing because we're going to yeah. talk about remote work today. Apparently, with yeah, well, startups and large we're back companies. Back on the so. this is another edition of uh, the remote show. I know. Is that what we call it? The remote show? Yeah. Is that because yeah. God's yeah. involved now, or is that just because we were calling it? So. Um, well, it's because I I sometimes feel very remote when I speak to you. As you should, David. Yeah. And there's a reason yeah, for that. So, we put an ocean in a an ocean, a couple of lakes, a pond, and a river, and a, I think a couple of forests between us. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that, that's how it is. And yeah. um, and yeah, and of course, Michael, that's his speciality. So, yeah, he's a real yeah. so so two. He looks like an elf years. today, though. He's all dressed like a little Santa elf. Is he? Well, let's 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 get him on. And let's then, check. So let's can, check it out. We'll check. There oh. he is. Oh, he's he's dressed as Easter Bunny. That's yeah, true. it's it's the it's the time of the season, time of yeah. the year. Okay. Unless you're in Key, unless you're in Key West, then that's every day. So yes. you know, you gotta be careful. <laughs> upstate, upstate New York, upstate yeah. New York. We've got uh, a bunch of snow on the way. Have nice. To support that, and uh, yeah, dress for the weather. Dress for the weather with a Santa hat. <laughs> nice, very nice. Yeah. In a, in a town that's three miles away from the Canadian border, I think they celebrate Christmas in Canada. Yeah, we've got it. We've got it over here. Not quite over the not quite over the border, but we're we're up here. We're up here. Okay. Very close to it. Well, happy holidays to you. Yes, happy holidays. Yes, you. happy it's, holidays. It's, yeah. it's, and you're going to be here next Friday as well. The the two days before the pagan holidays. So we're very excited. <laughs> So we will definitely uh, definitely be there. Definitely. Okay, very, very cool. So and today, what are we gonna learn? What are we learning today about other than apparently God works remotely, which I'm very excited to hear. Um, because we play poker on Thursdays. So now I'm excited to know that he has a remote work because I felt bad that we took his money. Um, what are we doing today? What are we what are we teaching people about remote work today? Well, okay, so the thing with remote work is regardless of whether you're working in person or remotely, you're going to have to make a decision as to whether you want to work for a startup or an established company. And there's some very big differences that need to be considered because what I noticed is there are certain people I've, I've seen people come into the startups that I've worked for that weren't suited for startups. And maybe it's because they just didn't know what they were in for. And so I wanted to outline some of the differences. We'll pull up some articles from Forbes from indeed.com and just, pick up some of the, the the differences that they've talked about, and then we'll have a little, a little discussion about it too. Sure. All right. So we can start with start with the upside. There's a lot of positives to, uh, to working the startup life. And uh, one of the things that Forbes talks about is this, this, as, this aspect of the passion of the startup. Now, I, th- I think that a lot of big companies, of course, can also have a lot of passion to it, but there's something about startups that are coming in when you have a founder, a CEO founder with a, with a startup company who's uh, eager to change some business, some uh, change some some aspect of the business world, there's a lot of passion. And what what we're hearing about it in Forbes is they say there's nothing like the bonds you can build through this creative process and intrinsic ownership created. So you're building something. And I've always said when it's, when you're working with a startup, you have to be willing to build. And uh, I don't know what, what. Why don't you tell me a little bit about your experiences with startups, if you guys have that? Well, I've, I've so I've been startup where I've been like employee number three back in the day, and I've been at startups where you're employee like thirty. The I like getting dirty. I mean, you know, I like dirty. No, no. Anyway, I like getting dirty. So when I was working, I liked being at a startup because you literally got to know A through Z. Because you like being whether I was a CFO or COO or whatever I was. Yeah. Um, or even a founder or a board member, in the very beginning, you have to know everything. So as the company grows, I enjoyed the fact that if something was wrong or so you could look at something and go, that's not quite the way it works. Um, So I like that with a startup. 
with the larger companies to go to that one, yeah. the difference is, is you're a wheel and, and you're, you're a, a wheel in the cog, right? So I don't know what's going on in every department. So if something goes wrong, I can only tell you what's going wrong in my little world. But in a startup, especially if you're one of the first like 20 employees, you really have to know everything. You, you're like, you, if the trash needs to go out, you take it out. I like that because it builds, I think, a better team. Instead of being a company with 10,000 people, you know, like Disney says, oh, we're family, we're this, we're that. Okay, but there's 10,000 people. You know, they don't all know each other. I like that where we all know each other. Even if we had offices around the world, we all knew each other because we all started, you know, like, I remember you came aboard, you were employee, you know, 53 or something. So I do like the startup um, way. And I like the fact that you can learn and grow together. We're in a bigger company. It's sort of like, do that. Okay. You know, it's like, that's it. <clears throat> yeah, I'd have to agree with I'd have to agree with Stephen on that. Um, yeah. I find that you know, literally, you know, putting out the garbage, uh, unpacking stuff, packing stuff in. Um, yeah, I had a couple of uh, started off with many years ago doing a post order company, and later on we had a you know big warehouse, and yeah, it's just nice to you just to get in there and pack stuff up, and you know, just do whatever you need to do. Because I totally agree with Steve. One of the issues that you have working for large organizations is you become slightly disenfranchised as to what it's all about. And and as you grow, if you're a part of the management team or one of the owners at the beginning, and people come with you with what appears to be very, you know, simple questions, which in an organ a large organization you'd be a little bit poo-pooed or you wouldn't have the guts to ask it. You know, people you, people come and say, oh, you know, how do I do this? How do I do that? And you know exactly how to do it because you've had to do it yourself. Yeah. You know, so, and, and I, I, I think that also helps on the, you know, to, to lock people in as well. Yeah, it, it does become a family, but like all things, you know, when it becomes a certain size, it's not interesting anymore. I, I like the beginning. I'm, I'm good at the beginning. I'm not so good at the end. That's what his wife says. But um, boom. Thank you. Mural here Thursday. Try the deal. So there you go. So, yeah. But no, but, said, what about uh, you, Michael? Michael, you do. You've done both. What do you like? What's, what's well, your so, What's your pleasure? Yeah. So the uh, so working in startups that have that have generally been in this. I've worked in startups that are generally in this sweet spot of a hundred to one hundred fifty people who are looking to hit that scale. So ten million in revenue, looking to get to a hundred and more, which means that you have to build processes that are going to give you that scale, which also right. like you pointed out, Stephen, it, it really requires you to know a lot and to also be working with a lot of different people, which is what I've always enjoyed about the startup life, is that even though, so going back to the Forbes article, even though they talk about the risks of a startup, which is that most startups don't make it, and that's just the, the reality of it, that's just the numbers game, um, and also the work-life balance. I mean, I tend to be okay with the work-life balance where, you have to be on call most of the time anyway, especially in right. sales. Um, you have to do that. But the excitement of building something is actually what uh, what what gets me going. And, and working with so many different people across sales, marketing, product, engineering, and then working directly with the C-suite has always been a, a big pleasure of mine. So uh, so that is a big difference with, uh, with the stars versus the big companies because you don't always have – that uh, you certainly don't have that access to everybody that you would when the company is at a smaller size. And I think maybe that's what you were getting at, David, is that, uh, you know, at the smaller size of the company, there's, there's, a, there's a knowing that, uh, that you're able to have. So there's a much better chance to, to get to see what everybody else is doing and to understand how the company is actually going. Yeah, uh, well, I realized uh, many years ago um, what I... Oh, did we lose sorry, him? Dude. I, sorry, I'll try that um, again. So I, I, sorry, I, I realized many years ago what I couldn't do, not what I could do, but what I couldn't do. Mm. And I found it, um, yeah, I, all my energy, my ideas, the things I wanted to do, to, um, you know, to, to push things forward were always really right at the start, right at the, in this first year, the first 18 months, um, I mean, as it started to grow, I had a couple of businesses that, that you know, after a couple of years, I sold um, because uh, it got, you know, um, shall we say, too familiar. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I found I, I found as much as I 
um, enjoyed doing it. It didn't have, it was like drinking champagne without the bubbles anymore. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, you don't want so, that. Um, so, uh, but, you know, still champagne, still, you know, still had all the plus things to go with it. You know, running your own business, et cetera, et cetera. Working eight days a week and for, uh, for you know, 40 hours a day of the normal stuff. Okay. But, yeah, it didn't, um, you know, I, that's all, as I say, I realized it took me many, many years to reach that point. What, what, what I'm not good at, and I'm not good at the, the extending my, my activity levels to year three, four, and five. Right, right, right. And so, and that's right. Yeah, go ahead, Stephen. No, I was going to say, so Dave, what are we doing? Three years, three seasons? That's it. Okay. Three seasons. <laughs> this is it. Season two is next year, everybody. You got a year after that one. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. I'll be dead by then, Stephen. Oh, well, that's, that's a good point. Good point. I'll be looking but, for a new Well, actually, new actually, I, actually, I spoke to my accountant. I'm going to take a year off dead for tax reasons. Okay, good. I like the way you're doing that. I think that's a smart move. Yeah. yeah. You got to think about the taxes, right? You always got to think. Yeah, listen, you good. always got to think about the taxes. You know how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so let's talk a little bit about the big aspects of the, the companies of the big, the, the, the aspects of the big companies, the large companies, companies that have been established. Now, I've only worked for, I've had some experience working for Apple as a campus representative when I was in college, and I did some consulting work for Microsoft back then. And that's, that was my main interaction with the big fish. And the thing is, I mean, and the Indeed and devmountain.com talks about this is that you look at, you just, it's all around the fact that these larger companies are established. So a question that I always, that I put into the course and that I ask of people who are looking of what to do, whether you want to do remote work for a large company or a small company is, um, is mainly how do you feel about processes already being established? So at a small company, like we were talking about at a startup, you're building everything. You have the opportunity to put your ideas to the forefront and find things and try things that are going to work or not work and at least have your opportunity to try it out. But at a large company, as, as Stephen was saying, everything's already in place. There's a process, there's a system, um, which is good for some people. Some people really like having that, that aspect, that system in place. Um, do you guys have a, view, a viewpoint on those different, uh, that, that kind of system, the fact that these larger companies just have it down pat in many cases? Don't, trust me when I tell you, larger companies do not have it down pat. I've worked <laughs> for Fortune 500 and global companies and whatnot. And yeah, I don't think anybody has it down pat. I think the fact, the only thing you have going for you, if you're a big, big global company, is you have some processes and you have some you know, SOPs, you have some HR people, you have some lawyers. You have that. When you start up, you don't, right? It's like, oh, we never had this happen. What do we do, right? Because you can't know everything. In a bigger company, things have happened. Mm -hmm. The bigger companies, I make my, my analogy always is they're the Titanic. Mm -hmm. So when something happens at a big company, you cannot, like in a speedboat at a startup, you can turn that wheel and pivot that quick. Like it's boom, we can fix it. We're done. Let's go. Usually at large companies, it's sort of like you see it, you start spinning the wheel, but by the time you can get where you can fix it, you've already scraped the side of the yeah. boat to the iceberg. Um, and that's what I found that's at every large like, company. Or, or again, so like a super tanker, when things have to change, right. it needs a lot of distance to, to slow up and a lot of distance, a lot of time and effort mm -hmm. to, to bring it back the other way. Yeah. But I'm yeah, glad horses for courses. Yeah, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you there, David, but I'm glad that you brought that one up because um, – the fact that the, the reality is, so somebody said to me, uh, working at a startup, isn't it riskier because startups fail? And in a way, that's true. But we talked about it a little bit last week. And uh, at least in the tech industry right now, it's really the larger companies that have been on these hiring sprees that are going through these massive layoffs right now. And, uh, and as, as I mentioned in, in Telepeer, they did a research, they do a, a, a quarterly project on B2B companies. And uh, 5,000 companies out of these 5,000 companies with under 1,000 employees, most of them are still hiring, just not at the rate that they were. Right. So, uh, so there is probably because of this agility, because you're able to, these smaller companies are able to see and pivot and move a little bit faster. They didn't have this issue of over hiring and then having to, to cut back dramatically. Well, I think part of it right now, some of the companies you see, like Goldman Sachs is looking to cut, like they said, 40% of their workforce because of the bonus. I don't, Apple is doing it 
Facebook or Meta, whatever they are this week, everybody. I think part of it is if we've gone through a 20, 22 year period of growth, low interest rates, other than the crash in 08, right? The crash in 08 could have been avoided, but God forbid guys like me and investment banks should, you know, worry about the public because we don't care. Point full stop. So you're all investment bankers care about one thing, their bonus in December, just so we're all clear, right? And Goldman Sachs is perfect for that. Um, I think what happened was is we went through this, whether it's a 20 year or just 15 year period of growth and interest rates at like zil. So people are like, we're going to grow, we're going to grow, we're going to grow, we're going to grow. No, things happen. So between interest rates going from 300 basis points now to like 500, 600, 700 basis points, between FTX crashing and um, the other one crashing, and between this, all of that is the perfect storm. So what's happening now, even Amazon said on their intern program, they're cutting back to hiring in. Um, when you graduate, their graduate program, they usually hire you in May. Now they're pushing it off to December next year. So everybody now is going like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's like, OK, this is interesting. But now what do we do? Like, what are you going to do now? So when 08 happened, they used to say, oh, we finally hit the employment rate that we were before 08. And it's inherently wrong because they never once you're, I think, unemployed for 18 months or two years, you fall off the chart. Yeah. The then chart. the other part is, is that just because I have a job that doesn't some people had three or four jobs. So I'm underemployed, but I'm employed. So I remember there was an article in The Economist and one of these economists was saying, it's like, you know, they say, oh, unemployment right now is 17 percent or whatever the matter because it's more like 30. If you take all these factors, and I still say unemployment today in America is probably in the very high 20s. Mm -hmm. And I'll be generous and say we'll say 20 percent. But I'm thinking it's much higher if I look at the variables of people that have fallen off of unemployment, people that have to do odd jobs to make a living, people mm -hmm. that have five jobs to make a living and go through the list. I'm assuming unemployment's in the, in the high twenties, not this five, six, look at us. That's great to, you know, jerk off the American public, but it, realistically it's not. And you can see it every day, you know, sales are down. Let's, I'm not going to look, won't we'll look globally, but sales are down at all the retailers on luxury goods and the list goes on and on. So it's not that people have money. People are worried about how they're going to pay the rent, how they're going to pay the heat and how they're going to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. Full stop. And I don't think people look at that anymore. To your point of a startup being at risky, I don't think so. It's just, you know, like if you're in a dumb startup, yeah, it's risky. But if you have a startup and you've got some money and it makes a profit and you have a sound business plan, I think you're okay. Um, the last startup, not Noisy Panda, David, the startup before I did that had a sound business plan. They did really well. We pivoted and we changed it to make it better. It did well. So I'm not worried about that. And I'm not worried about VCs because VCs are idiots. Let's just be right. They all invested in FTX. They all invested in Enron. They all invested in all these uh, morons. No one does due diligence anymore. It's just if your buddy's in it, they write a check. So just because a VC does or doesn't like your startup, that does to me, does it mean that it's bad. And I think, you know, people have to get out of this. Like, so and so, I don't care who invested in it. Like you need a sound business plan. You mm -hmm. need to make money. If a VC or a bank wants to put money into you after that's great, but you need to get a B and C done before you can go D through Z. And I think the problem is it's been easy money now since like, you know, 1999 and the 14 year olds who start companies don't get that. It's like, you have to have a sound plan, a foundation, then we can go look for money. And I think that's the bigger, that's a bigger issue. So for remote workers, they think you have to pick and choose wisely, which means you need to really understand if you're going to a startup, I think you need to really understand their plan. That's and right. I always ask people when they say sit on our board, I'm like, what's your plan? What's mm -hmm. your five year deal? Mm -hmm. And I said that the other day to someone and they were like, I don't understand the question. I'm like, where do you want to be in five years? Mm -hmm. Like you're at 50 million today. Where do you want to be? You want to be at 100, 200, 300? Do you want to be public and have 10,000 new best friends? Do you want to sell up? Do you want to do roll up? Like, what are you going to do five years? Because I play go. I don't play chess or checks, checkers. I like go, right? I want to look 100 years out and know how to work backwards. And I only need to play, then we call it the what if or game theory. I need to figure out everything. So if there's a problem, we've already thought about it. And then so most companies don't. They play checkers. Some play chess. A handful, and mostly Asian companies, are the ones who play Go. Mm. And that's why they're dominating the world right now with everything. Mm. And, you know, and I think that's an issue. I think if I'm going to a startup or even American Express, Disney, whoever, I need to feel comfortable that 
my little, your plan is good. Not so I don't care about your, your ethos, your ESG, your political correctness or how you treat gays and straight. I give a shit about any of that. I need to make sure you have a sound plan for five years. So I know I have a job for five years. Mm -hmm. Same with the startup, right? I just need to make sure that if I'm going to go work for you, that I need to know that for the next five or 10 or 15 or 20 years, I have a job. It's not going to be like tomorrow we're painting the moon blue. Oh, okay. There's, that's a business plan. So I, and I think people don't think like that. They're all like, oh, do I get life work balance? I don't care about your life nor your balance. When I run a company, I need you to work. I need you to work. So we make money. Why do we need to make money? So you have a job and so does everybody else. This life work crap, ridiculous. And that's why I think Goldman's also cutting it, right? Because in London, they complained that they had to work 80 hour, 100 hour work weeks and they dropped their in their first year investment bankers down to like a 60 hour work week. And I'm like, pussies. When we were doing it, we were like, it was crazy. And, I, and I, it's just, we've become such a bunch of wimps or pussies or pick whatever your vernacular. And I think that's the problem. Going to a startup, I worked 80 hour, 100 hour work weeks. My team worked with me. I would tell them when I would hire someone, listen, you're going to be in finance or ops. We, I get in at five in the morning and I leave at eight at night. Here's our schedule. If you want to work at home, I don't care, but this is the schedule. This is what we need. If you get your work done in three hours, I don't care. Take the day off. But because of everything that happens, especially in a startup, you have to have the mindset that you're going to work more than a 40-hour work week. Right. And no, you can't right. sit there and go, it's the weekends. I need family. I don't give a shit about your family. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Like, I, I'm hoping you're happy and they're all healthy. But I don't care that Johnny has a baseball game unless the work is done. And right. Sally has a, 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 a dance recital. And I think that's where... You know, people go to me, they're like, oh, you're like a dinosaur. Okay, but the companies I've been with have been successful because when I hire you, we have this dialogue. Full stop. Like, you know where I expect day one. Not It's not, it's not a surprise down the road. And I think that's the other thing. I think people are trying to be this politically correct and not offend enough with that. Like, it's okay to offend somebody. It's okay to raise your voice. It's okay to get mad. And they're all like, they don't do that. And then they wonder why things don't happen or they can't make things happen. Or there's five people out of 50 that actually do the work. So like I'm saying, I think there's a lot of factors that go into it. I think like in, you, you, like in your class, I think part of it, you got to say to someone, you need to see their plan. They need to understand a five-year plan and make sure that it at least makes sense to you. It may be the dumbest plan in the world. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. You may look at that and go, that's the dumbest thing, but it could work. Right. Then go to a startup, right? Because you don't know. But mm -hmm. if you look at something and you're like, they're going to fly to Pluto and bring back rocks, probably not going to be around for a right. while, <laughs> even though Elon Musk and everybody will give you $100 million after that. You, you know, what are you going to do? But if you have a plan and you're like, hey, you know, this company has legs and you want to take a flyer, take the flyer. It's OK. Um, it's no different than if you go to a big Fortune 500 company, you know, they're with automation, laying people off outsourcing, the list will go on, you know, you have to make sure that the department you're in fits within their five-year plan. Right. So there's no, there's no correct A or B, go to a real company or a startup. You just have to go where you think that you'll add value and they'll add value. And that's really what you're looking at, in my opinion. The rest of this BS about ESG and political correctness and saving the world and climate and do we, are we trans friendly? I don't care. Like when we ran our startups and our companies, where you're like, if you're a human being and you're married to a human being, you get healthcare. Full stop, we're done. Like, I don't care anything past that. So it's very like, I want you to be the best you can be. So I will give you the tools to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you have to look at. Like, what are you going to do to help me be successful? As the other question I always ask, sitting on boards, it's different. I'm like, what do you do for your employees? How do you help them go from A to Z? Like, can they advance? Why can they advance? What, how do we And so all these things, I think, become um, the questions that a remote worker should ask, because especially if you're not going to be at the office, you kind of need to know what's going on, because the last thing you need to find out in the newspaper or on, you know, or on BuzzFeed or whatever, that, hey, my company is shutting down. Or I'm getting laid off because sure. some guy took it over and doesn't like me this type of thing. We, we have a thing here, which I always found really strange. You have to have... Um, Terms and conditions to work, your employment mm -hmm. uh, has to be a standard contract. 
and it's for yeah, X number of hours, X number of hours a year, uh, sorry, a week. Uh, and then they put at the bottom of the advert, no nine to five mentality. I like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, and there's always a debate about that. So, no, you are, you know, I have a, an employment contract um, because probably I think the Dutch in, 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 in particular work less, I think, than anybody else in Europe. Well, two hours a day, David. I don't know if that's a lot or a little, really. I'm not really sure. So. Yeah, it's um, but uh, it's so uh, yeah, and a lot of a lot, lot of part time workers here as well. So uh, it's it's amazing that things well things are, are slowly falling apart. It seems. But, um, <laughs> yeah, David. Well, they'll so be kicking David out. So, they'll be kicking so, David out so, shortly. <laughs> so. You're out. <laughs> Yeah, well, that could happen. You see, because I have a British passport, so I'm no longer welcome. So, uh, yeah. well, let's, I, let's I'm, re I'm registered. I was registered as a guest worker. Ooh. There you go. Okay, you got registered. Then. That, yeah, I have to be registered as guest. Yes, yes. Actually, have a, a, a documentation that says you're a guest worker. Mm -hmm. Well, those are so those are really good points that you brought up, and I think asking the right questions before you engage with whether regardless of whether it's a startup or a, or an established company you do need to know what the plan is for not just your department but for the company itself and with a startup you get the opportunity to ask those deeper questions and get a get a, a deeper answer from it from the people that you're uh, you're interviewing with and also this idea of yeah the not the nine to five mentality i think you need to be motivated enough, self-motivated right. enough to want to build something. And that's why I was saying, I started this off by saying, I've seen people come into the companies that I worked with or have, have come through the interview process at least, who are clearly not suited to be part of a startup, which means that you have to wear many hats sometimes, you have to put in a lot of hours in a diverse way, and you have to be really creative in, in terms of the way that you're responding to the marketplace and in the terms of the way you're responding to your customers. But I don't think a lot of people, Michael, understand that because we, when we went to school, you're still too young. When David and I went to school, you know, back when you had a chisel and hammer and stone, to, that was how you I've took notes. Yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah, you've heard about it. So you've seen movies. You know, you had to think in school. The yeah. teachers, like, they taught you to think. Today, like, uh, they're like li little drones. And if you don't know how to think, you don't know what questions to ask. And at universities, they don't really teach them to think. I'm sure at some they do, but most they don't, right? It's like, let's get you in, let's get you out. So you have to teach people, I'm assuming you'll do this in your course, you have to teach people how to think. And it's okay to ask questions. You're like, I, have, I love when I talk to some recruiter will call me and say, they want you to sit on a board and they say, do you have any questions for me? And I literally say, I know every book says I'm supposed to ask you. I said, well, what are you gonna tell me? You know nothing. I need to talk to somebody. So recruiters, and I mean this, no disrespect to recruiters, useless for questions, unless you're going to ask the standard, like, what's my salary, but I don't care. But when I talk to someone at a company, especially if I'm sitting on a board, I'm like, tell me about the company. What's the deficiencies? What do you really need? What's the, and you ask really, if you're getting a job, whether you're the CFO or you're a first year accountant or whatever, you need to ask the same questions that you would ask if you're a board member. Because you really need in a startup to understand it. And even if you're a Fortune 500 company and they're hiring you, you need to understand that company to make sure that, once again, it's your department or the company is going to still be what it is X amount of time down the road. So you still have a job. So you don't have to do the process again. So I, it's a level of it's I, I also feel like it's uh, if you're talking generationally, it's maybe a, 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 a feeling of ownership. I've always mm -hmm. felt a very high level of ownership wherever I've worked, because you care about the mission, you care about the people, you care about the impact that you're having. And you know that, at least you, at least I felt like, you know that, that that's what it takes just to keep things, uh, just to keep the ship level, is right. by putting in an, uh, uh, an exceptional amount of effort. And, um, you know, just having that level of ownership actually helps that when people feel like they're invested in a company and not just their for the paycheck. And it's, it's unfortunate that lots of companies of all sizes are facing a, a workforce that feels like there's a level of entitlement or just thinking that you don't have to put in the extra effort or don't have to put in the extra creativity. And, uh, and I think that's unfortunate, but for the people who stand out, for the people who do believe that you need to make that bigger investment, that you're willing to put in that level of effort and willing to be put your real creative efforts behind the mission, 
um, I think the rewards are, are great. So I do, I know there's a lot of, or maybe you see a lot of people in, in the work that you've done who don't fit that bill, but um, I, I do feel like the people who at least would be interested in a course like what Bendicoot is offering or interested in even this show are people who are willing to push themselves in yep. different ways so that they can excel in their jobs. Well, yeah, I don't think people that are going to listen to this or do your course or people that want to, if they don't, if they're, if you're not listening, so to speak, or you're not doing your course or you don't have an interest in this, you're not trying to excel, right? right? You're just like, I get my check once a week or twice a week or whatever it is or monthly and I'm good. The people that are like, you know what? I can do better. I can be better. This will help me. Or the, well, this, somebody said something on the show that's like, oh, I never thought of that. Let me try that. Let me try. Then all of a sudden, now it's sort of like, oh, okay, I can be better than the person sitting next to me, which means I can excel at my job, excel at my career and do. But I think people, are, unfortunately, are not in, inherently lazy. And I think yeah, that's a, a lot, lot of people. Well, I think that I think it's a mixture, Stephen. I think it's an, okay. a mixture of laziness and envy. And okay, uh, you know, uh, because oh. somebody once said to me, "Oh, I saw you walking around at the supermarket at three o'clock in the afternoon. I thought you had your own business." Right. Yeah, do you know why I was walking around the supermarket at three o'clock in the afternoon? Because that's the only time, like five minutes, I had over. So I had to go back to the office. Right. Um, I was doing, you know, buying stuff in the U.S. So I had to be back in the office for the evening where everybody else went home at five o'clock, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but people don't see that. They said, oh, yeah, you know, you got, you got the nice car, the nice house, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I want all of that. Yeah, you can have all of that. Um, and, it, and hopefully you'll find somebody to work for who will respect the talent and the effort that you, bring, that you bring into the business and mm -hmm. pay you accordingly. And where you know, if you are lucky enough to find somebody, you can go on that journey with them, you know, and, and enjoy the work you do, and be financially rewarded for it, and have all the nice things. But you know, when you're or when you're just in the office bitching about the fact that the coffee's run out, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Wait, the yeah, coffee ran a, out. Uh, wow. Yeah, as a as a yeah, I mean, I mean, in hot, I mean, in, I've, I've been in some Dutch offices where they always want to go on strike because because the coffee's run out, as opposed to saying. Oh guys, um, I, you know, um, who's in charge of the coffee? Uh, something's gone wrong. I'll Let's just see. nip around the corner of the supermarket and get some. Well, right. we have a phrase at uh, at experience.com where where I'm a solutions engineer, which is uh, one of our values, which is be the solution. Right. Be the solution, which is when you see a problem, be part of the people who are actually going to solve it, as opposed yeah. to pointing fingers. And I think you guys have seen that as a quality in, in the companies you worked with is. Just taking that, that being that proactive person is, I think, makes I've become, I've become a big fan of this um, no blame culture. I know that this, I was sort of following it a little bit on the F1 scene and um, listening to people at to Mercedes, uh, you know, try, uh, using that. And interesting to find that Ferrari tried it as well this year, for those F1 fans among us, and they didn't. <laughs> and they, in, their own admission, in their own admission, it didn't work. Right. Um, but at Mercedes, they said, yeah, this is a no-blame culture. Hmm. It's gone wrong. Okay. Point of fact. And now we move yeah, on. Yeah, but see. Now, now, but now we build. I think that's okay. I, I'm okay if there's a problem and someone says we have an issue, but then you got to at least kind of give me an idea of what we could do to fix it. Just don't go, it's all yeah. blowing up. Okay, what do you want to do? And right. blame, I'm okay if you're going to, if like someone says, hey, so-and-so screwed up. But what I always tell people is like, so-and-so is your teammate. At the end of the year, your bonus relies on so-and-so. So if so-and-so screwed up, it's okay to say, hey, like, Michael screwed up. Okay, i helping Michael now so Michael doesn't screw up again. Like, I'm mentoring. I'm okay for some – there's no blame. It's like, that's, once again, your mommy told you you were special. Grow a pair of balls. No, no, so no. To it's, me, it's, it's, like, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that, Steve. Because it's no, no, I've seen – I've seen that. I saw the special. I've seen – I think it's bullshit. P full stop. I don't care if someone blames somebody, but then you are responsible then if you no, caught it think, to mentor them the and whole, go from there. The whole, the whole issue is not to avoid the blame aspect of it at right. all. That's fine. Yeah. You know, you if, you if you fuck up, somebody's allowed to say that to you and they're allowed yeah. to shout at your rant and rave, you know, because that's 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 how you learn. But you the uh, what happens is they cut the, 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 the organization insists that you that it stops there. That it, yeah, that that doesn't it doesn't work. go on. Yeah, but it, you know, it's like everything. You have to practice to do it. You have to practice to think, right. okay, let's move on. 
Yeah, because it went wrong, because uh, David did something wrong, what did he do wrong? Right. And people come back to you saying, like, you know, this is what this is what happened last time. Let's let's mm -hmm. let's talk about it. Let's move forward. Let's not like shout and say, uh, you know, four or five months further on down the line, oh yeah, he did it again. Well, who did it again? Me or the people who, who allowed me to do it again? But I think that comes back to the you have to have. It, you can blame someone, and you have to mentor them and fix them. I always tell people, I will spend hours with you. If you, if you can't get the cap on the pen, as long as you give me the time and the effort, you're putting it in, I will put it in. And the problem today is people don't want to put the time or the effort in. Yeah. And if you tell someone they did something wrong because their mommy told them they were special, well, I agree with you. they get I agree all with you offense. On that, and that's a bad thing. I agree with that's you. A very bad I agree thing. with you wholeheartedly on that. You know, well, to, be shouted, to be shouted down, and I don't mean that in a nasty way, but as a you know, metaphorically right. speaking, to be shouted down. You know, because you're not up to, you know, you know, you're not up to scratch. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because you you endanger your, your own job, you endanger the your colleagues' jobs, the organization. The right. People have take you on because you said you could you, you know you could do whatever it was that you were employed to do. And you yeah. You gotta do it. You gotta yeah, do it. You got to do it. And it brings up that the mentorship aspect is yep. that's also a benefit of startups. I mean, large companies have that, too. They usually have formal programs, but there's a level of mentorship that you can get that you should always seek out. I mean, more than more than the type of the size of the company, I think the, a good a good person should be seeking out mentorship, seeking out to learn from people and seeking out to educate others and pass on your knowledge. And I think that creates, whether it's a remote worker or an in-office worker, you have to create those, those networks so that you can share information um, and, and share that experience because it's, it's, you're not working in a silo. And I, especially now more than ever, you have to be more engaged uh, and more proactive in reaching out to, uh, reaching out to other people, so. Well, well, and see, once again, I think that's I think that's a, a mentality thing, and that may be an age thing, because yeah, mentoring that's that's a patient. You got to like I've mentored people, and you know that's a kind of you and I got started, right? So yeah, yeah. I I don't ha I like mentoring, but I am not, and Michael can attest to this. I am not going to give you hugs and give you a kiss and tell you you did wonderful. Michael said said, and he's been on the phone to I'm like you effed up. Here's what you need to do. Get this done. Stop being a pussy. Kick in the door and go forward. Like that's how we start. Like that, and people are like, "Whoa!" And I'm like, "But now you understand where what, what's going to happen, right?" Because a lot of people are like, "It's okay, you made it." No, it's not okay. You made a mistake. Why did you make it? Let's figure this out. And everybody, and because the parents are all like, "Johnny got it." I don't care about Johnny and his trophy. I want you to be the best you can be here. And I think that's we're losing that as one as a society and two in business. Like we don't do that anymore because we're afraid we're going to hurt our workers' feelings. Well, you know what? Get a pair of balls. And that's same with customer service people. If you raise your voice to a customer service person, yesterday we were on the phone with someone, customer service, and we said something, and I raised my voice. Like, hey, can you hear me? And they go, you know, sir, if you talk, if you talk loud to me like that, I'm going to have to disconnect the call. And I'm thinking to myself, what a pussy. Like, seriously. I'm trying to explain to you. You say you can't hear me, so I raise my voice, and now I'm screaming at you. Well, then when I talk normal, you can't hear me. Make up your mind. So we have literally just raised a, a generation of a bunch of little pussy mamby pambies that can't get themselves out of a wet paper bag, and I have no empathy for any of it. So, um, when, and I, I don't know as a, as a as a company hiring people now, um, which we have to do. I'm I I applaud the HR people, and I wish I always say to them, good luck. Because I, I don't want to know. Well, the, uh, well we, maybe we'll talk about it next time. I have this vision sure. for the rural, uh, the rural renaissance, which is actually something that Nishana and I were even featured in an article, a local paper. Oh, cool. And it, the, we'll get into the concept next time. But I, but I, I hope that the, what we're doing on this show and what we're doing with Bendicoot is actually to shape the next generation of workers or the people who are entering the workforce in a way that actually is effective and productive in that that they achieve the goals of the mission of the companies that they're working for. Because we, you're, you're, you've, in this show just today, we've brought up a lot of qualities that are really important. Uh, the, the curiosity, the willingness to put in the effort, the willingness yep. to be flexible, um, and, the, and just even knowing the plan is so important. Um, asking the right questions. But those are all things that uh, I'm not giving up 
on uh, on the future workforce. And <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna make some, we're gonna make a good impact here. Well, we yeah, will, just, and I and I think one, your course is going to be beneficial. One last thing, just to add to that, uh, uh, Michael, is to also is to ask to find the right people within the organization, you know, and they and they could just be the lowest person on, uh, you know, that that is seen by everybody else. Oh, he just does this, and then because there's a wealth of information, that's one of the things I find uh, the most painful about getting old. Um, you know, there's like there's a I, it just happens that I'm not not wise. It's just that I'm old enough to have had a lot of water travel under my bridge. Mm. So it's given me an opportunity to see a lot of good, the bad, and the ugly. Yep. And in a lot of organizations, there isn't the possibility where, uh, you know, you're able to share that with people. So, you know, look for the older members of staff if you're working somewhere. Um, find out, you know, because they would have seen it all before. Yep. Mm -hmm. smart, and, smart um, companies are bringing back uh, smart companies and we'll end on this note I suppose but smart companies are actually bringing back people who left the workforce at maybe they retired early through COVID there was a lot of people who did that and people are looking to bring back senior members some companies are looking to bring back senior members because they do have wisdom and experience that you can't you can't have if you didn't live through the time and I think that we talked about this before, this concept of intergenerational wisdom is just the reality that we are a society of you, you need to be able to share that wisdom throughout the entire, uh, entire group of, of humanity. And that means from the, from the people who have been there and seen it all to the people who are brand new and make sure you just keep that tradition going on. And uh, I think it's really important. So here we are. <laughs> Here we go. And I like I like the fact that you're doing the show because I think it'll help people out. And I think that they just take yeah. the time to listen to it. Yeah. It's good. And, and the old guys, we don't know anything. We know that. I always tell people I'm just a finance guy. I don't know anything. It's all you young 14 year olds that know something. But every now and then we have a pearl of wisdom. Um, so, you know, every now and then it may not be the worst thing in the world to, to listen. But your courses are going to cover all that. And these shows every Friday will cover all that. So for yeah. everybody, that should be perfect. So. Thank you so much, guys. No worries. Yeah. We'll see you next Friday, everybody. Michael will be back. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Nice you another edition of the Remote Work Show. There you go. Guys, we'll see you all next week. Everybody have a good Hanukkah. We'll be back next time for Christmas right. or that pagan holiday you people celebrate. So. Yeah. <laughs>